Parachuting today, as well as being a way of deploying troops quickly to the battlefield, is steadily increasing in popularity as a sport. Ever more people are turning from conventional parachuting to the more spectacular skydiving. Indeed, it was as a dangerous sport that parachuting first came into vogue. This was soon after the French Montgolfier brothers had successfully developed the hot air balloon just over 200 years ago. Frenchman André Jacques Gannara made the first parachute descent in 1797. He rode in a gondola beneath that of his brother, who simply cut the rope connecting the parachute to the main basket. Soon a number of adventurous spirits had taken up this novel pursuit, which also saved lives when balloons caught fire. As the 19th century progressed, parachuting from balloons grew in popularity as a spectacle, with the parachutes beginning to look like those of today. The coming of the heavier-than-air flying machine provided a new platform from which to jump. Yet it was not until 1912, almost nine years after the first aeroplane flew, that parachuting from these began. Women were among the stunt artists who quickly took up parachuting. Indeed, it was an American woman, Tiny Broadwick, who in 1914 was the first person to use a ripcord to operate a parachute, instead of relying on the static line attached to the aircraft to open it. The Great War of 1914-18 saw the aircraft become a significant military weapon. Yet the infant air forces of both sides were slow to adopt the parachute for their aircraft crews. This added to the risk of death or serious injury to those who flew. The Western Front in France and Flanders soon saw tethered observation balloons being used for gathering intelligence on the opposing trenches and for directing artillery fire. Unlike those who flew aircraft, the balloonautics, as the British called them, were equipped with static line parachutes because their balloons were very vulnerable to hostile aircraft. The parachute pack was attached to the side of the basket. Many a balloon observer owed his life to his parachute. The authorities thought that equipping aircraft pilots and observers with parachutes would merely encourage them to abandon their machines unnecessarily. The pilots of stricken aircraft were therefore left with the choice of jumping to their deaths or remaining with the aircraft and hoping that their resulting injuries would not be too crippling or fatal. True, the British Calthorpe Company produced their Guardian Angel parachute for air crews, and this was successfully tested by the British Royal Flying Corps in January 1917. But it was the German Air Force that first issued air crew with parachutes early in 1918. Yet Allied air crew continued to suffer agonizing deaths, 
many of which would not have occurred if they had had parachutes. It was an omission which would not be rectified until the war was over. Between the two world wars, some air forces arranged practice jumps from dirigibles for their crews. The 1920s also saw the development of sport parachuting. Daring young women took up the sport in increasing numbers. Parachute towers were built to provide a cheap and reasonably safe form of the sport. Parachutists also began to jump in groups, known as sticks, from the same aircraft. But as spectators became aware, parachuting had and still has its hazards. One is the jumper's chute being caught up by the aircraft. The worst is the so-called Roman candle. This is when the parachute fails to open. When this happens, the result is inevitably fatal. During the 1920s, the concept of parachuting men into battle began to evolve. In 1927, the Italians dropped a stick of nine men with their equipment. In Russia, however, a complete airborne division was formed in 1934. Prior to jumping, the paratroops themselves climbed out onto the aircraft's wings and clung to ropes for safety. This and the sheer spectacle of the mass drops amazed foreign observers. It was the Germans who took most note of what the Russians were doing and formed their first parachute battalion in January 1936, setting up a parachute training school at Stendal near Berlin. By the outbreak of war, the Germans had a complete airborne formation, 7th Flieger Division, which was under air force control. Unlike the normal parachute, the German service version suspended the parachutists from just one support line. While the parachute was more difficult to control, the wearer could fire his weapon as he came towards the ground. The first use of paratroops in war was in April 1940, when the Germans invaded Denmark and Norway. On the 10th of May 1940, German paratroops also dropped into the Netherlands. Their task was to secure vital bridges 
in order to assist the advance of the ground forces. The detachment also seized the airfield at Volhaven. This was quickly reinforced by troops brought in by aircraft. The most spectacular German airborne assault was against the Mediterranean island of Crete in May 1941. The initial attack was made by both paratroops and glider elements, who took off from newly overrun Greece. Their immediate objective was the island's airfields. The first day saw some 2,000 paratroops killed, and most German senior officers wanted to abort the operation. Early on the second day, the Germans succeeded in capturing Malemi airfield, and reinforcements could be landed there. This was decisive, and within a few days, the British were forced to withdraw. However, the Germans lost so many of their Junkers Ju-52 transport aircraft that they never again mounted a major airborne operation. In the late summer of 1940, the British formed their first parachute battalion. The paratroopers' first jumps were done from barrage balloons. They then graduated to the Whitley bomber, which meant jumping through a hole in the floor. The Americans, too, followed suit. By 1944, they had no less than five airborne divisions. Early Anglo-American airborne operations were not wholly successful both in French Northwest Africa in November 1942 and during the invasion of Sicily in July 1943, poor navigation and high winds meant that the drops were very scattered. In contrast, during the Normandy landings of June 1944, the Allied airborne forces, which also included gliders, were highly successful in quickly securing the flanks of the beachhead. Two American and one British airborne divisions were used for this. Each man now had a reserve parachute pack fixed to his chest for use if the main chute failed to open properly. Perhaps the most ambitious airborne operation of the Second World War was that in the Netherlands in September 1944. The Allies tried to outflank the Germans by securing bridges around Eindhoven, Nijmegen, and over the Lower Rhine at Arnhem. American paratroops successfully captured and held those at Eindhoven and Nijmegen. They caught the Germans largely by surprise. Ground forces were able to pass over these bridges and advance towards Arnhem. But this proved to be a bridge too far for the British and Polish airborne forces. Two crack Waffen SS divisions were in the area, and the paratroops had a hot reception. A bitter battle ensued in the suburbs of Arnhem. Eventually, superior German firepower proved to be overwhelming, and the survivors were forced to surrender. 
Air combat during the Second World War took place at very much higher speeds than during 1914-18. The parachute saved the lives of countless airmen. It became one of the main means of inserting agents into enemy-occupied territory and for delivering weapons and explosives to resistance groups. Parachute was also employed to deliver urgent supplies to ground forces. Specially designed containers were used for this. In the dense jungles of Southeast Asia, the parachute was often a vital means of resupply. Paratroops remained a key element of armed forces in the years after 1945. The Russians maintained their pre-war practice of having large airborne forces. Means of dropping armored fighting vehicles were developed. The Russians used a retro rocket to soften their landing. French paratroops were used extensively in present-day Vietnam during the early 1950s. This was especially at Dien Bien Phu, a village astride the main communist Viet Minh supply route. The French seized it in November 1953, but were besieged and eventually forced to surrender. French paratroops were also in action in Algeria in the 1950s and early 60s, during the war for independence there. British and French airborne forces also dropped at Suez in 1956, after the Egyptians nationalized the Suez Canal. British Special Air Service developed a method of parachuting into the virtually impenetrable Malayan jungle during the campaign against the communist terrorists there. Having landed in the tops of the trees, the SAS men abseiled down to the ground. American paratroops carried out two operational drops during the Korean War of 1950-53. However, in Algeria, and more especially in Vietnam, helicopters were increasingly used to transport troops quickly around the battle area. This meant that airborne operations at the tactical and operational levels were now becoming obsolete but they could still be employed to deal with a long-distance threat. Thus, in November 1964, Belgian paratroops were flown from their country and dropped into Katanga to rescue Europeans trapped by the civil war then raging in the Congo. Modern, fast jet crews now used ejector seats instead of conventional parachutes to enable them to escape from their stricken aircraft. The fast jet has also given the parachute a new role as an arrester to help the aircraft to reduce speed immediately on landing. <laughs> 
sport parachuting continued to grow after 1945. New parachute shapes were developed in order to make the parachute easier to steer. In more recent years, parachuting out of aircraft and balloons has not provided sufficient challenge for some adventurous spirits. A new sport of parachuting off fixed points, such as mountain ledges, has developed. The record height currently stands at 19,000 feet from a mountain in Pakistan's Karakoram region. But some parachutists also leap from the lowest possible altitudes. This form of base jumping, as it's called, has been practiced since the 1920s. Base jumpers have leapt from New York's Empire State Building. It took the jumpers about one minute to reach the ground. London's famous St. Paul's Cathedral was the setting for an especially cheeky base jumper's exploit. He jumped from inside the dome and survived to tell the tale. Not surprisingly, this caused consternation among those inside the cathedral at the time. On a more serious note, the parachute has, in recent years, been given an important humanitarian role in supplying communities cut off by natural disaster, famine, or war with the basic means of survival. Yet for the parachutist of the 1990s, skydiving, or free fall, is the ultimate thrill. But again, this is not a recent innovation. For an American, Spud Manning, developed the free faller's spread eagle position as long ago as the early 1930s. Free fall, though, is the closest that man has come to flying like a bird. But skydiving does have a military application. Special forces use it as a means of covertly inserting teams into enemy territory without being detected by radar. This technique is known as halo, high altitude, low opening. The ultimate.